So thank you very much, Dr. Eisenberg, for agreeing to be interviewed for all the uh, professionals interested in child and adolescent psychiatry. And we really appreciate the opportunity to come to your home this afternoon on the weekend to talk to you about your memories and, and keep them for the rest of the generations of child and adolescent psychiatrists. Uh, and we appreciate your contributions to our field in such a broad way, bringing so many different perspectives. So I wanted to first begin by asking you um, about your uh, country uh, where you were born and, uh, and where you grew up. And just tell us a little bit about your very early uh, childhood and your memories. That's a dangerous question to ask <laughs> because I might start about early childhood and go on for the next three years. <laughs> I was born in Argentina. My father was Argentinian. My mother was from Europe, from the Ukraine. And they had three daughters. And at that time, um, young girls in Argentina were to go to school only obligatorily until the age 11 when they finished grammar school and then they did whatever they wanted. And I went to an all-girls school because the public schools were, according to sex, divided. And out of 40 little girls and one teacher, I was one of four that went to junior high school. And it was like an hour and a half uh, from where we lived by its subway and train. And, but we went through high school. And my parents were wonderful without any pressure. They gave us a very clear message that we could study as long as we wanted. And so of the three daughters, one went to law school, and two of us went to medical school. My other two sisters never finished because they got married quite early, and I went through high school. And when I was about to finish high school, my parents, uh, who were not religious, would take us to museums or lectures to improve our knowledge of whatever the subject was that looked interesting. And one time they took me to a psychiatric hospital, a state hospital that was Dante's Inferno. I never have seen before or since then a more horrifying place. And at the end of the lecture that was for the general public, uh, people surrounded the man that eventually became the, the, a full professor and was then the director of the hospital. And at the age of, I was maybe 15, 16, I realized that those people were asking some stupid questions like, are you afraid to sleep in a place like this one? Is insanity contagious? And I realized that was one of many stupid questions. And out of this shy, lanky, inhibited adolescent, I've heard myself saying, is there anything I can do to help? And the professor looking at me, obviously saying, when you finish growing up, come back. But what he told, told me was that when I finished high school, he would like some help to start a school of psychiatric social workers because he had come to the United States and had just returned and would like to start it, but he had no money or personnel or anything else. So I went back to my high school and I got 20 of my friends and we went back the following week and said, when we finish high school, we would like to start this school and uh, as long as somebody can teach us. So he found the people to teach were the people that were residents mostly there. 
and I became the non-paid first secretary to the school and graduated from that school of psychiatric social workers. So that's how my career started in psychiatry, because after I finished high school and I finished with an MSW, maybe it was a different title, I don't remember that. Um, I decided that I wasn't ready to just give little tickets for turkeys at Christmas time. I really wanted to work with patients, so I applied to medical school. I want I to take you back to that visit uh, to the, the psychiatric hospital, and you accompanied your father there, um, and you were 15 years old. 16, 16 years most old. likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. T tell us about what how that happened and why your father decided to take you along and what because was he what was his uh, position my father uh, my father and mother um, would take us to anything that they felt that would be culturally enriching for us that time it happened to be me i don't remember why my sisters didn't come um, and uh, I, they didn't have any other reason. All of them, we grew up in a very Catholic country. My parents were not religious, and the, the little girls were going to church with the parents, and they didn't want us to feel different that stayed home. And uh, they took us to, to places, and then my father, I don't know, but must have seen in the paper that that conference was open to the public, and that would be, be an interesting place to visit. I don't think there was any other reason. Right. And then you went to the uh, University of Buenos Aires to study Correct. medicine. Yes. And uh, how was that experience like uh, in terms of mental health teaching and... <laughs> at the time, I'm just curious. It was then a very large school. Each class had loads of students. Uh, women were ignored so because I learned subsequently, they thought they are going to get married when they get to be 20 or 21, so I bother, why bother with them? I did not know when I applied to school a single woman physician. I knew only one doctor, that was the family doctor. And uh, it was a strange place to be. Uh, for me, I fell out of sorts for many reasons. Um, and we went to medical school for eight years because we followed the European system. Uh, with no college in between, and uh, I was one of the very few that graduated eventually. I worked, uh, you might be interested in this, I worked at the school, what they was called La Escuela Sanchez Picado. It was a school, it was called then, the School for Retarded Boys, and there were 20 or 30 boys living there and one room school and I was the director of that little hospital and I lived with the patients and one couple and I lived while I was in medical school uh, in that school and it started although I think it started much earlier it started much more formally my interest in child psychiatry how many women were there at the time in the in your medical school year? Because you were one of the first uh, women in the medical school. I wasn't school. one of the first, but uh, I was one of the earlier ones. Uh, and I couldn't tell you how many we were. We were the very unusual person in a classroom, and there were very large classes, and I couldn't tell you how many there were, but very, very few. Very so few. But for all of the things that I have to to compare what the education was. I'd like to remind you that it was then very different than what it is now, and that now women, of course, I, I suspect that it's in, in equal numbers to men, but then it was a very unusual thing. But I couldn't tell you how many there were. But two things that were good about the education in Argentina in general, that it was free, 
uh, all the graduate schools as well as primary school and the, the middle school, the high schools, they were free and uh, you won't have to take entrance examination tests, but um, there were very, very few. There were many classes where I was the only one. So, I was very scared when I had to go. I don't know whether you want all these details, sure. but no, no. I, when, I, I think it's. Uh, I when, think the 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 situation uh, of your experiences within Argentina and might somehow reflect upon what you subsequently did later on in your life in promoting academic mm -hmm. career development uh, among mm -hmm. women and, and well, yeah, young yeah, trainees and. Was, and human rights involvement. So I'm trying to see how those early influences had something to do mm. with it. When I announced to the, my family I wanted to go to medical school, my parents were, as always, had been very understanding and very supportive. I mentioned that earlier. But I had a nun that I was very fond of that told me I should not go to medical school. And when I asked why, she felt very adamant and very insisting. So I asked her why not and she said, well your sisters have boyfriends and they are going to get married. I'm sorry for the plural, they, each one had one boyfriend that eventually they married. But, um, but if you go to medical school no man will ever want to marry you. And I said why not? And <laughs> Her answer was very simple. First of all, you are going to faint at the sight of blood. You are not, have not been exposed, fortunately, to illnesses, and you'll be very inhibited or fearful. And second, nobody will want to marry a woman that has seen a naked man. <laughs> And that was her simple answer. So, and she had me very scared. I would, I would have been scared anyway. But we started medical school in the month of March because the seasons are reversed there. And I walked for the first day of classes to a long, 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 long aula, a long classroom. And there were 20 cadavers. and. Incidentally, with no air conditioning in the room, and each one had a small amphitheater. Each classroom had one small amphitheater for about two, 20 students and two tiers of people standing up. And I was terribly nervous, of course, and uh, I was by then maybe 19. Yeah. I was 18 or 19, and uh, I was in the upper tiers and selected one young man that looked sort of strong. And I said to him very quietly, with the cadaver and the prosector and ready to start, I said to him, I am afraid I'm going to make a fool of myself. Would you help me if I am? Because I am very anxious. I said, I'll take care of you, don't worry. He was very kind. So the, the men in charge of the autopsy unveiled the cadaver, and I heard the news. <laughs> These men had gone down like <laughs> to the floor, and I had to help him. It, he was my very first patient, because I had to help him get up. He was very embarrassed, and I was fine. And in fact, I love autopsies, and then, not that I love autopsies, what I love was the anatomy of the human body. To me, was the most incredible experience, and how things fit into each other, and how the arteries knew to run parallel to the veins, and how the f organs fit so tightly. I was so much so that I volunteered again, going to that psychiatric hospital where many of the patients had no family and had been there. They were chronic patients. And uh, I helped the man that was doing the autopsies, and I went every Saturday, and I did autopsies and, and learned a lot about anatomy. In fact, the professor of surgery one day came by 
and asked me why didn't I go into surgery because I was so good. And I said, no, I want to be a psychiatrist. That's why I went to medical school. But I had an interesting experience and going back to many women uh, in that whole section of the 20 students and the first experience, I was the only woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, um, so when you graduated from the School of Psychiatric Social Work before you entered the medical school at University of Buenos Aires, uh, how old were you? Um, About 20. 20. 20 maybe 21. Right. Yeah. And so this... Uh, 20, I was 20, 20 yeah. And this is very unique, the idea of the School of Psychiatric Social Work, because if I recall, uh, even in the United States, I know that Adolf Mayer's wife, where you subsequently came at Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. was one of, is noted to be one of the founders of psychiatric sure. social work in the United That's States. Sure. That's so this is this is what you were doing. It was really quite uh, trend-setting stuff, and uh, it seems. In terms of, are you aware of that? Or I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. No, I, I, I wasn't aware of anything. Yeah. I just always put one foot in front right. of another and moved on, hoping that it will work. Um, no, I wasn't aware of that. It's very know. unique, though. It's a, it's a very yeah. unique interest. And so, you, um, so you were, you said that you really decided that you want to do psychiatry, and uh, oh yes, and that's why I went to medical school. school, and that's why you went to medical school. Yes. So you, in fact, before you went to medical school, you were. Oh. No, before I went to medical school, I had the same doubts that, mo doubts that most adolescents have. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I would do. I didn't know how I would do it. I didn't know whether I want to be a professional person. I just, the only thing I wanted at that time was do what all of the young women did, of my social class. Um, I just want to get married and have families. I have babies. I, that was the only thing I knew for sure. But the other things I... I had no idea. Well, one of the, uh, I, there was a thesis requirement to graduate from yes. the University of Buenos Aires, and right. your thesis was uh, a histological study of Tay-Sachs disease. That's right. Which I'm sure, subsequently, Dr. Leon Eisenberg would have been very proud of, because he was very much interested in all these mm. very rare conditions mm. and genetic mm. disorders that have a contribution, cognitive mm. development. What made you decide to choose that as a thesis? And is that something that you had a mentor or is that you were at an influence? No, I didn't have a mentor. Yes, that's not true. I did have one mentor. Um, it sounded very interesting yeah. to me. It sounded very, very interesting. I couldn't understand why those children eventually die, what, what I had no idea of the genetics of it. Mm -hmm. Very few people had at that time, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact. And it was a requirement that I had to fulfill. But right. uh, but I did know I wanted to go into child psychiatry. Right. And, that I, and that's what maybe was one yeah. of the factors. That said and then you started your psychiatric training at the Hospicio de, de las la Mercedes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, my psychiatric training at that time was to a minimum because since I have done the training as a psychiatric social worker and we didn't use many medications, um, I didn't have to, to do much more psychiatric training. The only thing that I wanted to do was to learn more child psychiatry. I had worked for a while as a consultant while I was in medical school in the school system, and I got to know the one child psychiatry that I knew in Argentina, the Dr. Tobar Garcia. But she was spending her days in the school system, just giving approval for a child to graduate or not, or to be moved to the upper class according to the, their IQ. I wanted to do more than that. And that's what started my interest, that one of the many reasons to leave Argentina mm -hmm. and to be trained in child psychiatry. I also wanted to travel. I also had personal reasons why I wanted to be trained somewhere else. 
and I applied for a fellowship, which I got, and to my enormous surprise, and the only two names I knew, and they were just names, were Leo Kanner at Hopkins and Anna Freud in London. And uh, I sent my doctoral thesis and my CV, and to my enormous surprise, they both accepted my application, and then I had to make the decision as well, and I decided to go to Baltimore for a series of complicated reasons that I don't want to take the time, but I can explain if you want me to. I ended up there. So you were very much... And that's what I did really in my training in child psychiatry. Right. Although they were kind enough, eventually they named me a fellow, but I... I that's what I started. So you playing. graduated from the University of Buenos Aires in 1944, and then how long? <laughs> how long afterwards did you come uh, to the United? I left Argentina in 1945. 45. Mm -hmm. And I arrived just at the end of the war in September. Now one would say that, um, at least I would say that, Leo Kanner and Anna Freud were very different. They were both leaders in child psychiatry, but they were sort of uh, represented unique. Um, attributes in terms of their work. Both of them obviously were scholars and yes. leaders, one representing uh, psychoanalytic theory and Leo Kanner more to do with sort of the beginnings of an academic psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So um, what made you decide, uh, how did you know uh, <laughs> that you these two people were such influences and why did you, you know, I mean, how did, how did you write to them, uh, decide to write to them, and choose them, select them? Because it's, it seems to me like a very good selection, but at the same time, uh, you were obviously not decided as to which direction you wanted to go also. I did not know the difference. Mm -hmm. I really did not know. They were the only two names I knew. They were famous. Uh, because they were, well, not necessarily. of course, Anna Freud was Leo Kanner had written the first book of child psychiatry. We didn't have it in Argentina. They were the only two names I knew, and I applied there just because I didn't know the difference in their, their uh, evaluation of patients and the, what I learned subsequently. The differences were uh, quite marked, but I did not know. I did not know. I came really not having any awareness of what the differences were, and just I ended up in Hopkins just out of some difficulties in getting visas for a visa for England because it was after the war and it was, they told me I could go, they would welcome me, but they, uh, they didn't have enough housing, they didn't have enough of anything after the war. And uh, in Baltimore, it was quite different. So that was really the main reason. Yeah. It was in the the differences in their Well, thank you approach. for explaining that. That's really, it's very helpful to know. So tell us about Johns Hopkins in 1945, Baltimore, and um, your experiences in entering uh, this, uh, obviously a very important American medical institution. and. Also, the beginning of that first academic department in child psychiatry. Um, so it must have been a very interesting experience. Well, I was obviously very much impressed. I, the fellowship that I got uh, obliged me to spend one month in an American city to become, quote, Americanized. So I had spent one month in Washington, and I could tell you lots of stories about that first month. They were enormously difficult for me. I was very homesick. It was what most of the students, particularly one that had been overprotected and who had never been away from home. And uh, it was a very difficult month, and we were to go to a school in whatever city we wanted, from nine to five, five days a week. 
and I didn't know enough English, although I thought I did before I arrived to to Washington. And uh, I was in a group of eight people that were a mixed group, really, from the point of view of interest and educational background. And the teacher wanted to learn Spanish, who subsequently understood. And uh, so we spoke Spanish all day long, and I wasn't learning any English. And at the end of the day, we were to memorize the national anthem, and I understood that. And I thought, if I come into the United States, I have to do that. And I did. Do. We would stand up and put the hat hand in our hearts and sang it and that I understood but then we had to we had to sing I came from Alabama with a banjo on my knees <laughs> why that who knows and to this day I cannot understand but at the end of five days homesick as I was desperate to be with people that I could learn from and that day Hopefully, I could form a social group. I hired a translator, and I went to Johns Hopkins and had an interview with Leo Kanner, who was enormously helpful to me, an extraordinarily kind person, a warm man who understood that I was so... So sad, one day I just burst into tears and I said, I don't know whether I can make it. This is so different. I was living in one room. I was overcharged and in some ways mistreated by, a, by the owner of the house where I rented the room. And then his wife, Leo Connor's wife, June Connor, invited me and <coughs> to spend a weekend with them. And I went there, and um, they treated me with such kindness and such warmth. And uh, my life became easier uh, because I had his support and his understanding. And But I was impressed with and depressed both by some of the things that I saw at Hopkins. I love the respect that everyone in this country had for Johns Hopkins. And if you talk to the local people at Hopkins, they felt that they were the first and best medical school in the United States. And I believed it. I didn't have any frame of reference. And as I told you earlier, Leo Kanner was and not, you know, just marvelous in the opportunities he gave me and the kind of things he taught me. And But there were some things I didn't like. The first day I went into Hopkins, I came through the main entrance, and I don't know whether you know the physical setup, but I went by the main entrance, an enormous statue of three times the height of this room with an enormous Jesus Christ. And I could understand even as irreligious as I was, how patients, religious patients will relate to that statue. So I went by it and then I turned to a corridor on the right and I saw a bathroom and a sign above us for white women only, and the next one for color women only. Mm. I wanted to go back and go back by Jesus Christ and go back to Argentina. I couldn't imagine any society where those things still existed. It was awful. And like this, there were separate words for colored and white people, and there were some things that for me were very difficult to accept. So they were both, but mostly they opened the doors for me. They gave me an opportun opportunities that I never would have had in Argentina. I wasn't exposed to, certainly not in the service where I was working, 
they were absolutely nothing that I noticed. Maybe I was too dumb to notice the sexism that I'm sure existed then, but it didn't bother me because I didn't notice. I was so interested in learning and doing well and, and and I was part in child psychiatry, part in adult psychiatry, where I love going to the FIPS clinic, and part in the Department of Pediatrics. So eventually, when I became an assistant professor, I, b I was both in psychiatry and pediatrics. And I love the pediatric wars, and they were wonderful to me. It was um, a wonderful opportunity, which I was very thankful for. So following your training in child psychiatry, you worked in the outpatient department at mm -hmm. the hospital. We didn't have an inpatient. We didn't have an inpatient. Mm. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, so I'm going to ask you about your first husband, uh, Dr. Goodmarker. Mm -hmm. um, because you got married um, uh, during this I, time, right? And to tell us a little bit about how, because he was uh, also a psychiatrist in your in Yes, your yeah. He, uh, in fact, at Dr. Connor's home, where they had a dinner party mm -hmm. with bridge tables for four people each, they invited me two months after I arrived to a dinner party at their house. And one couple were there and I, and an empty chair. And the woman of this couple, the wife of the, the man, said, I guess we are waiting for somebody. His name is Manfred Goodmarker. And you better watch out because he's going to be late. And you better watch out. He's wonderful when he meet women and terrible afterwards. And that, that was the man that became my husband, with whom I had 20 incredibly loving, wonderful years. And he was a friend of Leo Connors, and he was born in Baltimore, one of twins, and both physicians who had gone through Hopkins, both very intellectual and very intelligent and very... caring people and very involved in things that involve social justice. Mm -hmm. They and their whole family. Yeah. So he so, was um, a forensic psychiatrist and he, um, yeah, he chief a, medical officer at the court clinic that's right. at the uh, Baltimore City's Supreme Bench. So he and I know that one of your first papers was on delinquency, on delinquents. Um, so, um, so he he must have had a very interesting practice experience, and he was a very one interesting practice in terms of experience and working with yes. people yes. who have committed crimes and murder, mm -hmm. and um, and he's regarded as one of the founders of forensic psychiatry in the United States. So I, 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 can you tell us a little bit about some of the professional aspects of, well, yeah. Um, so much that I can tell you. He was the fulfillment for me, all of my, my all of my adolescent uh, fantasies of the kind of husband I would love to have. Um, well, this is not the question you asked me, but I felt like telling you. He, um, yeah, he had an interest in practice. Uh, he saw several people that were very involved in the mafia. I forgot the name of that famous man that uh, eventually died of natural death, but his first private patient was this man that was being treated because he had syphilis, and they were treating him for that. He used to tell the stories of what happened to that patient. I forgot his name. 
But then, you know, eventually his fame became quite known nationally, and he saw Jack Ruby, who killed Oswald, who killed Kennedy, and there were several famous men that he saw as a forensic psychiatrist. And he had a special and very kind view of people that he would go and examine in jails usually, and they were, yeah. He also was very interested in history and wrote a couple of books about, he wrote many books, but this one was The Insanity of George the Third, because he became, at that point, and when he was dying, unfortunately, on a very, of a very short illness, is when it was discovered that he wasn't a manic depressive George the Third, but it was that paper that the father and son, father and mother, excuse me, mother and son wrote together, where the genetics were beginning to lift in the veil and to learn what the real reason was. He had the illness he had. He was an amazing man. He had um, Manfred. And he gave me two wonderful sons, and uh, I loved him enormously, and I was very upset when he died of an illness that was only three weeks. But uh, he helped me. Well, like all husbands and wives, when they are lucky enough to be involved the way we were. In some ways, he helped me grow up. When I married subsequently, a second time, my second husband, Leon Eisenberg, said he couldn't wait to meet Manfred in heaven because Manfred got the best years of my life. And at the beginning, he was joking, of course. At the beginning, I thought that it was because I was much younger and etc. No, it was because at that time I didn't know about that women have rights and that he said you were off the boat and you did whatever a husband asked you to do. And <laughs> 20 years later or 25 years later, you are different. Yeah. But he was much older than you. He was much older. Mm -hmm. He had been married before and he had two children. And uh, he was the first divorced person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it made no difference to either one of us, the difference of age. I also learned that he was a twin. And, and he had a twin brother, yeah. uh, Alan, that you named uh, your son. Alan Goodmarker, yeah. And uh, tell us about that, because um, he also was very influential in American medicine. They were very close. They were identical. Our own children and, and Alan's children, at, at up to an age, occasionally would get the father and their uncle mixed up because... Eventually, even the dogs, what we used to have, you would get them confused and, and greedy. And they were identical. They went to, you know, they were in the years where being an identical twin wasn't as common as it is now because IVF and everyone, you go to the street and there are lots of twins. But at that time, yeah, it would, they were very unusual, and they were very bright, and their father died at, when they were 18, and the mother went to work for the first time in, in her life, and they had to face an education that was self-supporting and important to the whole family. They came from a family of generations of intellectual people and they wanted very much to continue their education and they did. And they remained very, very, very close. They went to school, the same schools, the college. Had they both graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School. Right. And then they had offices 
when I knew them in the same building with the common secretary and I knew which one was going to see Alan because she was usually pregnant and who was going to see Maverick because occasionally it looked psychotic. But they were very, very close and both had brilliant careers and Alan became the head of, well, he was in obstetrics. In fact, he was my obstetrician as well. He delivered both of my sons, but uh, and he was a close friend, and we, we were very, very close. And then he moved to New York and became the president of Planned Parenthood and had and the Good Marker Institute is named after him. And uh, amazing, amazing identical twins, and both magnificent human beings. So, um, so Manfred passed away in 1966 and... Uh, in when? Uh, 1966. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that it was uh, unexpected and it was mm -hmm. a short illness. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, From playing tennis and being vigorous, uh, in fact, one of my sons began to think that something was wrong because he wasn't as energetic as he was trying to teach one one of my sons more tennis. And he was the one that prompted us to go to the doctor and the diagnosis was made and he died in three weeks. So it wasn't much time um, to get used to the idea of his time, yeah. Um, so you became a young widow in a way with, with two boys. Two other so, um, so I know that um, you moved to Boston uh, in sometime in 1967, 68, and and I know that Leon also moved to M a Mass General Hospital as the head of the Department of Psychiatry in 1967. Tell tell me about how you met. Leon and how the move took place and how... Well, I met Leon when both of us were training uh, at, at the O'Connor's. Mm -hmm. um, and he was happily married and with two children that he adored. And uh, I was happily married to Manfred and life was good for all of us. And then when Manfred died and he was in the process of the divorce, uh, we got together, it's another long story. And we were married and moved to Boston the day. So you moved to Boston together in, in, in 67? The day after we got married. The day after. We moved, we married on August the 31st and the 1st of September. We moved to Boston and he started his job at Mass General Hospital as chief of psychiatry then. And what were, what, uh, were your plans at that time? What, was, what, what were your my plans, plans? Yes, in Boston? <laughs> because you followed Leon and uh, uh, I'm just curious to learn about how... I did uh, follow Leon which now my granddaughter said, I don't want to be one of those wives that follows the husband. <laughs> I, I was one of those wives that follow her husband. Uh, I moved somewhat reluctantly. I knew I wanted to be with Leon, desperately so, and he with me, I knew that too. And. Um, but I had no time to make any arrangements to work here. I was very successful by, according to my needs, in Baltimore. I was moving up the academic ladder. I was seeing lots of patients. Most of the faculty members' children, who <laughs> the fathers were too busy developing their own professional things, and most of the mothers were depressed and the children were having symptoms, of course. 
but I was teaching, I was supervising. I loved working at Hopkins. Um, I just realized I didn't mention earlier that when my children were born, I so much wanted to have children, and I, the stepchildren became part of the gift that came with the first and the second marriage. Both of my husbands had two children when I married them. So I had a collection of children and stepchildren. But when I uh, had my first child, I stopped working because I wanted to have a very... I didn't mention that earlier, and to me it was important because I wanted to be as good a mother as I could, and this was part of my culture, that motherhood was the a gift that we had, and and I went to to back to work when they began to go back to school. So going back to my arrival in Boston, uh, because of the divorce proceedings of Leon and because of the hecticness of having to say goodbye to my patients and tell Hopkins I was not going to return and selling the house and looking for a house in, in Boston, and having a small wedding but getting ready for the wedding that we wanted to be, both Leon and I wanted to be special to our friends and special to us and to our children. They, it became too hectic and the pressure for him to start the 1st of September made us move to an earlier departure. So in my usual way, optimistic, I thought, I will get a job, you know, who will not want a well-trained child psychiatrist? And was then the only time in my life I went with my hat from place to place, do you have a job for me? I, and of course, the one that could give me the best references was the man that became my husband, my <laughs> Leon Eisenberg, and who would believe whatever he would write. So that created more problems, too. So it took me about six months to get my first job. Many uh, psychiatrists did not believe what you wrote, I'm, but... I'm sorry. <laughs> they were, I'm sorry. Many of the psychiatrists at that time, he was sort of a, quite ahead of his time in some of the things that he said. So that, well, as, as a matter you know, of fact, I mean that he should remain nameless because I don't think he realized what he was saying. I knew what I wanted to do because yeah. by then I had moved to adolescent psychiatry. I had a training in child and adult psychiatry, but adult adolescence fascinated me. And in fact, they continue to be of great interest to so me. The, so at this time, when you moved to Boston, uh, both Larry and Alan were, you know, all, uh, Alan beginning was almost to 18 be in years college. old. So, yeah, they were beginning college. They, yeah. and, uh, Larry they, was at Dublin College and Alan was a freshman at Harvard. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, and then you started at MIT as working as a staff psychiatrist. No, but I feel like telling you the story of what happened when I began asking for jobs. Okay, oh, that would be great. Thank I, you. I went to ask for a job. I knew I wanted to work in a college setting. And uh, I went to one of the colleges and the men in charge was very polite and very sweet and, and uh, greeted me and began to tell me how sorry he was that Manfred had died when he died. He had me in tears because I was happily new married, but I didn't need somebody to remind me that my first husband had died and the circumstance. But at the end of all of that, this is a was then a quite well-known psychiatrist at the end, he said to me, I said, and I need a job. We have four children to send to college, and it's the first time I, I don't have a job, and my husband, etc., my new husband, is etc. And he said to me, I tell you, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. I have no jobs for, any job for you, but if you want to become 
successful professional wife, I think you have to give up psychiatry because there are already too many psychiatrists in Boston. So why don't you do another residency in whatever subject you want? I, first, he made me cry, and secondly, he <laughs> told me to give up psychiatry. And I answered, I don't know where I got the strength because I had respect for him. I said to him, I'd rather go and sell clothes in the basement of Eileen's, but I am not going to do another residency. I did it in Argentina, I did it in Baltimore, I passed the national boards. I'm not going to do a new residency, and I love psychiatry, and I'm not going to do it. So anyway, uh, there were more adventures of that type, and I have some worse ones than this one, but eventually went to work at the MIT. But somewhere I am telling you what happened since then is my, my life evolved in different directions, in different ways. I think that you might want to hear more about child psychiatry, and I'll be happy to go over those years and know what happened since I came here. Right. So the child psychiatry, so you when you went to your MIT and then also in clinical practice, you were seeing children as well as adults? Yes, but there were mostly adolescents, adolescents. that I was seeing. Yeah. Children, very few. Um, a professor of pediatric at Hopkins, I think his name was Schweitzer, um, told me, that eventually either I will go into adult psychiatry or into pediatrics. The child psychiatry for most people in a general hospital is very tiring. You have to see children, of course, and talk with the social workers and the schools and, the, of course, the parents. and that it gets tiring, uh, physically tiring. It wasn't Schweitzer, then it was a professor that I talked to. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, and I saw very few children, children occasionally, of patients at, at MIT. Adolescents, I saw quite a large number. What was your experience of the practice of child psychiatry in Boston at that time? And how, uh, who sort of, um, people always say that it was more influenced on the psychoanaly uh, psychoanalysis and people who were leaders in the field of child psychiatry, some of them very well known, uh, were mostly child, child psychoanalysts teaching and Many of the I missed the last couple of sentences. Sorry. Many of the people who were well known in child psychiatry were psychoanalysts, and they were also the among the leading teachers mm -hmm. in in Boston. Yeah. So, how was your? Did you meet any of them? And who were these figures that you? Yeah. you, just, you can I, tell us a little bit your memories uh, about your interactions with them. I used to go to, of course, all of the lectures in adult psychiatrists. By then, Meyer had left many years before. And I began to notice a discrepancy between what I was hearing from Leo Kanner and subsequently from Leon Eisenberg um, and what I was observing in adult psychiatry that most of the brightest and the most um, promising young residents were all in psychoanalysis, but that Leo Conner's social factors and family relationships and uh, it was quite clear that they were not in favor of psychoanalysis. And uh, I decided to, I wanted to, yes, pay attention to all of the important things that were uh, influenced by social factors. And, but I also wanted to understand the inner works of what now I call is an stupid name that I invented in the last few years, 
the shrinking of the soul that it begins to to happen particularly as one grows older anyway um, even with the young parents i noticed that there were some neurotic conflicts they couldn't deal with so i decided to go into psychoanalysis myself and my own set of personal reasons and uh, i did but i felt i had to tell leo Kanner that i was going to do it <laughs> this was in Boston or it was in Baltimore? No, this was in Baltimore, Baltimore. with Leo Conner, yeah. an early, very early in my career. Right. So I went to tell Leo Conner, he had the, uh, the habit which the children, patients loved. He would have big cigars and he would send the smoke and will make rings of smoke. He loved to do that, and the children, patients, loved it. And when I went to tell him, I was trembling, of course, because I knew I would be a disappointment to him. But when I went to tell him, I decided to go into what I, we used to call didactic analysis in those days. You know, it was didactic for the first month and then very personal, of course. But at that time, I went through a didactic analysis and I told him, and he threw those things, those rings of smoke. And then he began to sing an advertisement that then was in the radio, advertising a soap that was called Daz, D-U-Z. And he would say, everybody does it, everybody does it. And he was right, I was doing it because I saw other people. I was happily married, I had two babies. I felt I owe it to him to tell him. And so I went into psychoanalysis, I went through all my personal psychoanalysis. I was approved to practice psychoanalysis in children and then at that point I decided not to go into psychoanalytic practice because my social conscience would have bothered me to see four or five children five times a week and all of the other children whose parents sometimes couldn't bring the children to the hospital because they didn't have money for car fare or whatever will go untreated. So I decided not to practice psychoanalysis, but I was in favor, and to me it was enormously helpful. And when I decided not to do that, I went to supervision by an analyst in Bethesda, and I would drive from Baltimore to Bethesda. Her name is Jenny Valderhall, and she was wonderful at the supervision, and I learned a lot. But the, the, the children's psychiatric service at Hopkins was very anti-analytic. And Leon was as well. And then when we were a couple and we were together, we had long discussions. And to me, it has been fascinating as I review our own professional lives. But eventually, Leon began to bemoan the fact that patients that uh, residents in training now don't get enough teaching of the importance of psychotherapy and he became much more tolerant of what the early influence of psychoanalysis was and he was always he was always against what the current was when the current was psychoanalysis he was against it and in later years, when the whole thing is giving a pill quickly and, you know, come back, and if you have any side effects of the medication, uh, let me know, then he was very, very upset about that the residents were not learning yeah. enough. Well, I'm very glad you, you emphasized that, because I'm also very familiar with that. Yes, of uh, course. His views. Um, I wanted to spend some time, however, and I, I know that we talk about child psychiatry and training of child psychiatrists, but also that what was important to you and also in terms of your career progress, progression, that you became the dean of students at 
Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and then at Harvard Medical School. And so th those were very um, informed experiences in terms of medical education, also graduate education, and career mm -hmm. development, which I think is very important for people to hear about whether they're in mm. child psychiatric training and mm. because it's career development aspects, which obviously you have committed a great part of your professional life. Yes. And among that, nested within it, this issue of the development of, you know, your interest in promotion of human rights in the world and, and your uh, yes. visits to uh, El Salvador and other uh, involvement and also the promotion of the career development of women, uh, not just at Harvard, but across the I world. Think, you know, these are all such big orders, and I think I, the I, disadvantage I, of talking some, to someone as elderly as I, I am, and with the um, incredibly lucky life I have had with serious, disastrous times as well. There is so much to cover. I don't know how to cover yeah. all of that. I know we can, t we can um, certainly um, continue. Uh, but I, I, think I have should... the time if both of you yeah. have, and I love to talk about my life because it has been a privileged life, and I want to stress that from the point of view of the happiness I have had, with two incredible marriages, with two incredible husbands. I'm interested to ask you about, uh, in your, uh, for example, advising students at Harvard Medical School, um, as to how your role as a child psychiatrist uh, played, because we do that all, and, and we always try to see how we can always recruit people into our field and uh, some of whom have already decided that they want to go into the field earlier on, but, but some have not, and uh, we want to have good people. And how was your experience there at the Harvard Medical School um, advising the students and seeing some of the um, mm -hmm. stu students come along and move along? I know that there are some good, very leading names among them uh, later on that came in. So which one of the five or six subjects you asked me to talk about? I want to know about, about your, uh, how you sort of navigated your uh, role as the dean of students and at the same time trying to promote uh, interest in psychiatry. Um, it came like most of the things I've done naturally. I loved young people and... Um, both at MIT and at HMS, the fact that I was a psychiatrist, I think, was incidental from the point of view of the people that made the decision for me to, to and offered me the jobs. I didn't apply for either job. But at times I thought that maybe the fact that I was a psychiatrist was one of the many much more important reasons why they they asked me, uh, particularly at MIT more than at the Harvard Medical School, because what it, were the years of the Vietnam War and there was a great deal of revolt and a great deal of student unrest and uh, whoever was more vulnerable or more determined to go into that field. They, not into that feeling, to that uh, political sort of activities. I think that uh, many of them, they comp not some of them, they compensated under the stress. At Harvard Medical School, the students te teased me because they had the Dean of Students Daniel Federman, and they had the Dean of Student Affairs, Carola Eisenberg. So they thought I was in charge of affairs of the students, and some of them teased me. But uh, they, they were, many of them, good friends that I continue to see now, and parenthetically, in the last year, 
Now the children of the students at the new students are coming to seek help on decisions usually uh, having to do with their future careers. Um, because I loved the practice of psychiatry and I loved particularly working with children and adolescents where there are still lots of hope, hope that all those incidental or not such so incidental problems are still fixable. There is an optimism that that uh, comes with it and you saw reversal of, of symptoms and you can so if anyone was interested in psychiatry they usually gravitated toward me and they would come and talk quite often and I did nothing but to encourage them and uh, at the same time uh, give some advice at two places because within the the adult psychiatry were different fields that were interested. Some wanted to do research, some wanted to do clinical work, and I knew by then which ones were to me the places where they could learn the most. So I made lots of suggestions and they came so I encourage them and I would encourage today anyone that wants to go into the field uh, to go into psychiatry but there was also a lot of like uh, Leon was talking a lot at this time about the uh, influence of psychoanalysis beginning the late 60s and early 70s and um, so there was a big transition going on in, in psychiatry around this time and you have these discussions with Leon at home. Um, so it's a, a time of great change uh, going on. Um, you mentioned that you had some ethical concerns that you would spend so much time seeing so few patients so frequently during the course of your week but you were also doing other many many other things and so um but you had an interest in in continuing that if you could intellectually you wanted to continue to see patients mm -hmm. and you always did mm -hmm. yeah yes i wouldn't have accepted either one of the two jobs that were offered to me if they wouldn't allow me to have a small okay. practice it was very uh, important yeah, it was to me very important. And that's an advice that you would give to the future uh, generations mm -hmm. of people uh, to keep a clinical Not so foot. much at MIT, but the president of MIT that offered me the job, I, when I raised that issue, because I wasn't interested in being an administrator, and there are a couple of funny things I could tell you about that. I said, among other reasons, I don't want to I, to be an administrator and I cannot leave my patients. And he said, as long as you can do your job as a dean, you can continue seeing patients whenever you want to. And in fact, I saw because I didn't feel I could stop suddenly seeing patients. And because I loved it, so I continued. And I, after I stepped down from HMS, I continue to see patients until two years, three years ago. Um, that was more at the Harvard Medical School than it was at MIT because at MIT I was an advisor to students that wanted to go into medicine, uh, but they did not know at that time whether, where, 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 what in medicine they wanted to do. Well, one of the things that I've, I've noticed knowing you is, and how people have reacted to you is how people feel that you have a deeply rooted personal interest in them and to learn about them, to care about them. And we heard today when we came to visit with you about your patient. Uh, that you told us about mm -hmm. that was very upsetting for you mm -hmm. so and this um, I think is a very clinical and but also a personal uh, aspect of how you uh, handled uh, many of these students mm -hmm. in terms of what 
So I don't, I wouldn't like to just reduce it to mentorship, but it's sort of a like almost like a, a deeply rooted interest and connection with people, uh, which is beyond mm. mentorship. And I, I've, I've seen that. So um, I wanted to know, um, sort of a shifting a little bit to your work on the Physicians for Human Rights and how do, how was that? I know that it was in the backyard of a house uh, somewhere in Boston, and I read about it. Uh, can I go back to what you were mentioning before, and then I'd Absolutely. love to talk about Physicians for Human Rights. I'd like to talk about two organizations. I spend quite of my interest and my time now. Um, but something has to do with the training in child psychiatry and adult psychiatry. I would just want to mention something that just sprang up, which I, I think is important. I have the same uncertainties that many new people in many fields, not just psychiatry, have at the beginning of uh, their professional lives. Am I good enough? Do I do it? everything I can? The poor child is having this problem or that problem or that problem. And of course, I did many of the things that I was taught. And in that way, not imitating because every individual is different, but proceeding as a therapist in the same way that whoever my teacher was at that time. And I continue. And then as life evolved and I became older, I began to trust myself and my own reactions to the patients as well as the training, which I, of course, I respected. And I could be myself um, more and more I trusted myself more and more, and I had some reactions that had to do with common sense and my interest in the patient being, being better. And I became, I think, a better psychiatrist because of that. I just want to mention, because many young people even imitate the gestures of the professors and, the, the, of course, the ideas and the systems and everything else. but. I, at one point, I, of course, they continued to influence me. I, I am forever thankful from what I learned from them. But I also trusted myself more. I just want to mention that. And now we can go into human rights or, or the Institute for Health Improvement. Those are my two interests at the moment. And they've been certainly physicians for human rights for 25 years. You know, a lot I can tell you. I don't know where you want me to start, um, how much you want me to tell you, and how much detail. I'll be happy to tell you. Well, that actually, um, starting with the physicians for human rights. Yes, that. Yeah, naturally. Um, I know about your in, recent interest in the Institute of uh, Health Improvement and very important to you now in your work today. Um, but that's a relatively new interest. Right. And PHR has been for the last 25 right. years. Yeah. Um, because in some ways that predates this whole, and I want to bring this up in this discussion, of global health because now there is a huge interest in global mm -hmm. health in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. U.S. medical schools, mm -hmm. among trainees, among faculty, mm -hmm. developmental <coughs> consortium mm -hmm. arrangements to promote this. This is an incredibly uh, new development mm -hmm. uh, in the last, I would say, last decade or so, and evolving as a very major influence in terms of funding projects. but. I know I was reading about you, and you were the one of the first people at the medical school at Harvard to be responsible for international medical education, um, together with this your teaching in ethics. And uh, but this also, I'm sure, has to be informed by your visits to 
Latin America and also mm. the beginning of the human the, mm. the physicians for human rights movement because it's sort of a it's the origins of this whole global health interest uh, and um, so I wanted to know there was a group of people that met to show this interest because they were it was mainly driven by an interest in human rights wasn't wasn't it or uh, and uh, human rights abuses and what you had witnessed in uh, rather than sort of uh, showing a general interest in um, trying to understand what was going on in other countries per se can you tell us a little bit about yes, that yes um i'd be happy to tell you uh, well, just briefly to touch on the interest uh, in global health. Uh, when I was a dean of student affairs, I talked with many students who had a very narrow view of the world, some who had never left Massachusetts and have never seen. And I felt that it was very important for them to see what the health systems were in other countries, what the social and cultural problems were in other countries for some of the patients in some countries. So I volunteered to add to whatever I was doing to that group of, to try to help them organize trips um, so they could have a wider view but it was an office before I didn't get it started. It was an office before that was working on a very part-time basis and uh, with not enough um, resources. And so I encouraged the students and we developed several programs and the students were very happy to go usually between the first and second year, although they did not know how to do anything then, but they could do some research and watch what was happening in those countries. And then between the third and fourth year, because then they had the summer that could take off. And that became very successful, and now it's just all over the place. Uh, and when I stepped down from being the, uh, having my position, for a while I had that office and gave him more impetus to that and was able to, with a committee that I formed of people, faculty members that were interested in supervising some of the students that wanted to go and some of the work they were going to do. And now it's not just the little bit I did in the medical school, but to my delight, it's an enormous interest in all medical schools, in all schools of social work, of public health, maybe in social work too, although I am not familiar with that, uh, to visit other places, to learn what other cultures are like, to try to be helpful to the societies where there is enormous poverty, poor health systems. Uh, to me, it speaks not only whatever the country can do, the students can do when they go to visit those countries, but also what they can learn themselves and not be as narrow-minded. And they learn as much as the, what they contribute, and sometimes more, they learn more than what they can contribute. So I am all in favor. Um, that has been a deep interest. I had it for a long, long, long time. I guess that was one of the reasons, curiosity, that brought me here, which I didn't mention early. But I wanted to do that. And that somewhat is related, but very indirectly related to my interest in human rights. And... Uh, I could tell you hours about my interest and my devotion to that cause, but I guess it was instituted way back when my parents talked to us a lot about the importance of 
social justice and society inequalities and their political interests and uh, intellectual and emotional involvement in those issues where was forever present in my childhood. Um, so I guess it started way back. But uh, then I was born and raised in Argentina. I was very happy in that country. Um, we were fed notions that I learned since then were not realistic. Um, and, but we, we were very patriotic and we were against wars in general in the country and in my particular family even more so. And yes, we learned and we suffered through the horrors of what was happening in Europe and uh, and what was happening in Japan, etc., etc. Uh, we read the papers voraciously. My parents talked at dinner time about a great deal about politics. And the, the, the issue underneath all of that was do whatever you can, to, with whatever you can, wherever you are, to help individuals, poverty, uh, torture, um, and injustices, etc. Anyway, that was, uh, it sounds more gloomy than it was really because we had a happy, happy time. We also talked lots about literature and music. And, but you made some um, key visits, right? You you did some visits too, like you were in Chile. Uh, yeah, in, but in I tell you what happened when I was offered to be one of the, um, to form an organization mm -hmm. that I am still very active. In fact, I spent all of yesterday and Physicians for Human Rights at the board meeting because I've been a board member. Somebody asked me with four colleagues, five colleagues, to form a new organization, I said I would. But the reason why I would, and I'm going back to Argentina, is because many years ago I began to hear what was happening in Argentina. And two of my f closest friends in medical sc school had two sons that were murdered in the middle of the day, in the middle of Buenos Aires, by one of those police cars. and. I was a member of the Psychiat American Psychiatric Association in a committee that was called the Committee on Emerging Issues. And uh, I was one of two women, first time they had women in that, that committee. And that was full of pain. I was by then living in Boston, married to Leon. My children were almost grown. And I told about the things that I have heard from my friends, and they got terribly upset. The newspapers didn't have as much, and they asked me whether I would go to Congress, and they would take a deposition, and I said I would. And then when I came home, I thought that was stupid, because my mother, my family, my, my, my aunts, my uncles, my nephews, everyone was in Argentina except me, and that they will take reprisals against them. So when a couple of years later, this doctor asked me whether I wanted to form, form a new organization, I said yes, and that's how we started Physicians for Human Rights with no money in a one room that we rent, rented in Somerville, hoping to do what we could. And uh, yesterday, three of us <laughs> met them, and they were all the other new members. And we figured out we, the three of us together were close to 300 years because we are so old. But we started and continued to work, and now it's a large, very large organization. Yes, I did go at the beginning, as I learned more and more about the human rights abuses that are rampant all over the world, and were then. 
I went to Chile where Pinochet, Pinochet was the dictator. I went a couple of times to El Salvador. That was my first trip. I went to Paraguay where the dictator had the dubious honor of being the oldest dictator in all Latin America had been a dictator for 30 some years. Yeah, I did lots of trips and then there were reasons why I didn't. But now PHR has expanded in lots of other directions and we do lots of things. We heard yesterday a group of people that went from PHR to the Congo, somebody went to Bahrain last week. Uh, we do a great deal of advocacy. We have an office in Washington that tries to influence the politics to the degree we can. Um, we've done a great deal of, in Guatemala, in Argentina, in several other countries over the years, uh, bringing up cadavers from that had been interred, uh, if that's the word in English, um, to do DNA so the relatives of the people that had been tortured and killed could identify other dishes. We went to many countries. Uh, we went in former Yugoslavia, uh, when people were taken in trucks and by the th hundreds they were being killed. Uh, we went to many countries. We went to, at the beginning, uh, to Israel and Palestine to develop health system. And what we try to do is, number one, we try to defend the doctors and people in the health services in general that are being tortured. We had a month ago the experience of doctors that have taken an hour at the moment in jails, and some of them had been already, they decided they'd be in jail for the next 30 or 40 years because they were taking care of rebels in those countries. In the hospital, they brought people that were, it's happening now. It's happening in, in lots of countries. So we try to protect it to the degree we can. And we were able to bring two brothers from Iran that were in jail three months ago. They had come to the School of Public Health at Harvard, and first one and then second. In fact, they were in this room because I had a group of people. And we got them out of, got them out of jail. Now they have moved to Canada. But uh, we, def we try to protect people in the health services that are doing what anyone with ethical standards that obeys whatever we had learned are doing. But we also try to help the torture. And, you know, we've been to Guantanamo, of course, hoping that eventually they will close. We do lots of, of work. We protect the rights of women. Yesterday, the people that went to Congo told us, you know, they are the raping of women in just as a success of their war, by raped by the military, children. The children were put in front of several, in two countries where they were between the rebels and the, of the military. They would put children in front of the military so the people, the children were the victims of the war. They were torturing and killing children. They, you know, we do lots of work that I, I am impressed and at times depressed because we touch one little ounce of the tragedies that are happening in the world. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for explaining all that. You know, sometimes Harvard Medical School now doesn't, with these programs, would not approve people going to some of these regions. Like I have a student that, for example, was going to go to North Korea and couldn't. Yes, but of course. Please, uh, 
Of uh, course. So I think, but I think these are what you're doing is, or have described us, was, is, is an amazing... Um, I taught the first course of human rights and the responsibility of physicians with a colleague of mine now in, in Norway. But I taught that course for 10 or 12 years, and it was a course that they, was not an obligatory course, mm -hmm. but they will get credit for it. And um, then other courses develop, and... Uh, and we were placing at, at so late that the students could not go. And now they are, they are courses in global health. Paul Farmer and his group are doing marvelous things. So um, we, I, I don't teach it. But it was the first course in any medical school about human rights and when I started it since then. In schools of public health they were teaching, but not in medic. And I had to go through all kind of things to get that course approved uh, early. But really? It was, yeah. yeah. It took some time to get it approved. <coughs> yeah. I am, I am... It's one reason why, as far as I can tell, your doctors can tell me different. One of the things that keep my amyloid plaques from not congealing in the brain, because my passion, I and mean, because I am lucky, my passion in those issues is so marked that I feel I have to do whatever I can. Um, and there are two groups, and one that's more recent. Than, I'm also very interested in you know. Tell us about the second uh, group, actually, the uh, the Institute for Health Improvement that you've been working with. And um, I think that would be useful for our uh, viewers to, to learn about. Yeah, I can tell you much less because I've been going here for a year and a half. I go to the staff meetings. I was invited by the person that then was the head of IHI. And so I went once thinking that I was going to a staff conference to fully understand what that was about. And uh, I become addicted to those, those staff meetings and go every Monday. And I am doing they ask me what are my main interests, but before I tell you that, I ought to tell you that I learn more things about health care and mostly how it's done in the hospitals and some of the things that are don't do credit to the hospitals, really. I learn a lot about that, that I didn't know in spite of my involvement in medicine. And... Um, they are having a meeting next month, which I am invited, where they are going to talk about the same issues that are occurring in the practice of in a clinic or in a private practice. And so I learn a lot. So they asked me to be a mentor to the junior fellows because they are six or eight every year that come from all over the world. And they... They stay here for a year, and if they want to, they can go to Harvard School of Public Health, and then if they stay an extra year, get a degree. And uh, so I am meeting with them as regularly as they have time. I I am the one that help getting started, what they call the mumps luncheon, where we go once a month and have lunch because there are many young women that are trying desperately to maintain their professional roles and be good parents and good wives or husbands. Now we have added men to the group. It's not any longer the mom's lunch, but the parent's lunch. Uh, uh, I am doing whatever I can to, to learn and to teach them. But the, it just occurred to me that during this interviewing, I have not touched on a subject that to me is terribly important, I, where I devoted quite a bit of time that has nothing to do or very little with child 
No, nothing to do, nothing. Just nothing to do. But the whole question of women in the, in the professions, I, I have spent quite a bit of, in, of time trying to help women in medicine in particular, because it's where I can be more helpful and write papers and encourage women that, yes, one can do it. It's not easy to raise a family and be a good physician, but it can be done, and you, you have to select a good partner. Of course, that will approve of both, and you have to devote a great deal of energy, but it can be done, and it should be done. Uh, having come from a country where, nine, I don't know the percentage, but I suspect 99% of the women, or 99.9 at the time I was there, the only career was, made, uh, was having a family and raising a family to have choices and to be able to develop one's intellectual curiosity to me has been and continues to be an important part of my life. And I realized that, that, that I didn't touch on that. But particularly in child psychiatry, one of the advantages was that in most cases, and not during day training, but afterwards, one can set one's hours, and when the children are small, one, ma one can manage more easily than if one does orthopedic surgery or uh, where more emergency occurs. So particularly in child psychiatry, uh, it's very, very important. But I just wanted to mention, because it occurred to me that I didn't talk, and I'll be happy to talk about well, it. How, how do you... Um think of, um, what do you think of child, psychiatry and so child psychiatry? Okay. We will stop soon, but um, thank you. What's happening? We need to change tapes. Mm. Just get them out. Thank you very much. Um, been, uh, we will stop in a few minutes. Um, it's almost five. But. So, that almost was Almost time to have at five o'clock, we can have a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> We are, You're we not recording that. They will think. <laughs> <laughs> they will think I am That's addicted the, to alcohol. <laughs> right, right. That might be. What a good was thing the for, question? I'm sorry. That might be a good thing for child psychiatry. Um, <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask you about uh, how you sort of um, think about where we're we going in psychiatry and child psychiatry, and are we going in the right direction? How do you? Yeah. How do you sort of feel the pulse of what we're doing? Can I introduce an old subject before and then answer Absolutely. that quickly? I don't think that I gave enough information about my marriage to Leon, and it somewhat touches on what we are going to discuss and re answer your question. I was married to Leon for 43 years, and we were friends before for another, I don't know how many years, certainly 15, 10, 12, I don't know. Um, and I don't think that uh, we were, because we were friends before, we had lots of interests in common, and lots of problems in common, and, uh, uh, and lots of minor differences of opinion in some political issues, usually. Um, and I just want to mention that how important he was in my life and what he contributed, in what way he contributed to my sense of uh, being a fulfilled personally and professional person. And I wish we had more time to go into more details. But for some words, I talk about the first marriage that I already told you, what was like, and the second marriage, uh, 
was wonderful. And I just want to mention that and what we had in common. Yes, and now I'll be happy to try to answer about child psychiatry. I think that child psychiatry, as well as all of the other specialties, and as, as far as medicine is going in this country, lots of changes will have to occur. I think we have a lousy system uh, of the practice of medicine in general. I was seeing a teenager and that just sprang I haven't thought about for years. A teenager that was suicidal and I saw him, he had insurance. I was seeing him in private practice. He didn't want to go to a hospital. So I called the insurance company to ask whether they could prolong that. And I said, I said to the person that answered the phone, I guess a college graduate had a job. I need more time with his patients. And uh, well, the rules and regulations are six visits. I said, but he's beginning to talk to me and he's having this and this and this other problem. And he's suicidal. And that voice on the telephone that his problem and yours is not ours. So, uh, you know, that's the worst example I can think of. But I think the system needs changes. I hope that they'll come and they'll come fast. I think in industrialized society like ours, is we have the lousiest system one can possibly have. In spe specifically about child psychiatry, I think all of the training of psychiatry needs to be changed. I think that they have to find a way by which they can combine the importance of psychotherapy plus medication. I think that has to change. I think that child psychiatry, I mentioned that earlier, has a future that's enormously important for society. We could prevent some of the pre horrible thing that happened to adults if we could. I think we ought to improve the social services that we can provide and the support that some of the families needs. And yet at the same time, I think that is the one of the specialties of the future. I think that before it gets not solidify is not the word, but before they become crystallized and all of the defenses get, get built up in, in, in rigid, rigid fashions, we can help lots of more children than the ones we help now. I think we ought to train the, the teachers. We ought to train more the teachers that sometimes cannot detect what is an illness and what it is, whatever they want to call it, stubbornness or whatever. I think we ought to do more training of that. I think that, that there are things that could be done and with a better system should be done to improve the practice. I think the children with handicaps, some, the ones that are lucky that they get to good centers get as good a help, but the things available for them. I think that this whole thing of the Asperger's and the autism have been moving too fast in directions that I feel are the wrong direction in the last two, two or three months because of the new classification of mental illnesses. Um, there are many things that could be improved and that should be improved. So can you expand a little bit more on the autism and the Asperger and the, the what I'm sure you read uh, in the New York Times and recently yes. about this class, new classification? What, what do you mm. think of that? I have had a very interesting experience two weeks ago, three weeks ago. That made me think more about it, because one of my sons, who is a pediatrician, um, sent me an email 
with a copy of an email he had gotten at the NIH from a 15-year-old girl that wanted to write the paper on autism and would he supervise her paper. So my son uh, sent it to me with a note saying, I took the liberty of sending it to you be and I wrote her that you know more about autism because of your work with Leo Kanner and your marriage to Leon Eisenberg and, and that you have more time. So I thought, that's the only, that's a sign for you. I don't particularly want to involve, involve with a 15-year-old girl with all of the things I have to do. So I sent uh, an email to the little girl and uh, She said that she very much wanted from what she had her to work with me and will I give her an impression or a, of the paper she had written for the first year of high school. And I said I'll be happy to help her with that. But then I got all hooked with this poor little girl writing a paper on autism at the age of what did she tell me? Fifteen, I think. Yeah, and then I said to send me the paper. And I tell you, that paper is a college or graduate paper. I was so impressed by the research she had done. I guess that how she got to Alan and to me and how she managed to do all of those things. So I was hooked. And then I sent an email telling her, I congratulated her on that paper. I asked indirectly, did anyone in the family help you? Because it's such a marvelous paper. And she got offended and she said, nobody helped me. I wrote it all by myself. And then she <laughs> said, would you please help me? Because that was a preliminary paper. By then, since I was hooked, I said, I'll be happy. Let's make a telephone date, and uh, you can ask me, because she had eight questions. So I said, I'll be happy to, to answer those questions. And I don't know what made me say. At the end, I wrote P.S. in the email. I said, you told me nobody helped you, and I trust you. Are you by any chance autistic? Uh, because she sent me in the email, I don't like talking on the telephone. We can do this transaction on the... So I sent another email back saying, I know that teenagers usually don't use the telephone the way we used to. Maybe that's why, but maybe you are autistic. And she, when she... And I said, you don't like the telephone, but I hate the internet because I do it that way and I cannot answer eight questions and spend half a day on that. And she said, I guess I'll have to. <laughs> that was the tone of the email. I'll do it by telephone. She set an appointment. We went through the eight questions and uh, they were she was just as bright. And then I said to her, I was through with that. You have a very strange name. I, she spoke beautiful English. I said, are your parents foreigners? And she said, my parents are from Iraq. And I said, um, but I was born in California. And um, so I asked a couple of more questions. What does your father do? He's an engineer. And do you have siblings? Well, an identical twin sister and a brother, older brother. So I began to ask more and more. I said, you never asked me the question, are you autistic? And she said, my father, my older brother, and my identical twin sister have been diagnosed with Asperger's. And I don't have any of the symptoms. I said, who made the diagnosis? three different psychiatrists. She's from a middle town in the Midwest. And uh, so I somehow felt that, that maybe she was related or she was a victim of that. Now, yesterday I got to have a picture and a letter thanking me for the time with a picture of when she was, she was registering the whole thing. 
my conversation with her, a picture of her. She does look Iraqi and um, with heavy glasses, but somebody took a picture of her. But she made me think of this whole question. And I really am curious if they are really identical to insisters. How come that one has Asperger's and how damaged she is and she doesn't have it? So I immediately thought I help her write the paper with her as the first author if she wants to make it public, which of course, and if the parents approve of it, you know, the are all kind of ifs and if. And I'll be the co-author and I get a geneticist to work with me, the whole question of the identical. But anyway, I begin to think about that, and I think the diagnoses are too exaggerated, and that they are uh, for reasons that I understand, because then the parents had, can avoid the mental retardation that some of them feel guilty about except with the Down syndrome, because the children look different and the parents get used to But when children that don't well in school, uh, the diagnosis is exaggerated because then they get private schooling or more money, and I don't know who makes the diagnosis and how familiar they are. I think they'll have to reduce that. And these people have to stop because they have to put my furniture back in place. And I think we better stop yeah. now. Thank you very much for Thank taking the time to talk much. to us. I enjoyed it. was it. wonderful. I don't Thank you. Thank you. Her la clack. Do you call it la clack? Thank you. La clack. Thanks. La clack. I have my clock over there, and I kept thinking they'll be bored to tears. No. Why don't they go for a cup of coffee or something? That was a great story at the end. It's some, that's an amazing story. I have the picture of that girl, and I haven't answered that letter yet.